I'm Harriet Vanceball, Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiologist from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm delighted to have with me Professor Devaka Pereira from King's College London. Uh, he's a principal investigator of the revived BESIS trial, and we are here at ESC 2022 uh, to discuss his hotline presentation. Welcome. Harriet, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to share the results with you and to perhaps discuss it in a bit more detail. So Revived BCS2 was the first randomized controlled trial of percutaneous coronary intervention versus optimal medical therapy for patients with severe ischemic left ventricular dysfunction. Now in the trial, we defined ischemic left ventricular dysfunction as those patients who firstly had very severe left ventricular impairment, an ejection fraction less than 35%, extensive coronary disease, which we quantified using the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society Jeopardy score. That's a score which has a maximum value of 12, which mm -hmm. means that all myocardial territories are supplied by, by diseased coronary arteries, and the minimum score needed to get in the trial was six. Uh, and also the third criterion, which was that we, there needed to be demonstrable viability mm -hmm in the territories that were being revascularized. So at least four segments that you were planning to revascularize had to be dysfunctional at rest and then shown to be viable on cardiac MRI, SPECT, PET or, or, or other modalities. Why did you choose to include viability as an eligibility criteria? One would tend to guess it would favor intervention, but on the background of the STITCH trial, it sure. did not demonstrate an association between viability and outcomes. Why did you choose to retain it? Well, as you said, we'd expect viability, uh, inclusion of a viability criterion to favor intervention. And that's really how the entire trial was designed. If there was a benefit of PCI at all, it would be in this group. And we wanted to, to focus the trial on this group. And if, conversely, if we didn't show it in this group, it's highly unlikely that there was going to be a benefit. Now, we probably don't have time to talk about the differences in uh, which viability was used and assessed in STITCH and in REVIVED, but very briefly in the viability sub-study of STITCH, it was used as a yes-no, a binary yes, the, the heart or the patient has sufficient valve myocardium or not. And then the surgeons did what they could and grafted everything. With PCI, as you and I know, we use it in a much more targeted and regional way. So it actually informed the strategy of PCI. It's, it's vastly different uh, context. But we thought we were, if you like, stacking the decks in favor of intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and if it were positive, then we'd look at you know, less likely groups. But if it wasn't positive, we'd have a definitive result. So that's why the trial was designed that way. Importantly, the patients had stable coronary artery disease and did not have uh, established heart failure. Well, they had stable coronary artery disease, yes, but they were also, also stable from a heart failure perspective. So we didn't take patients who'd been uh, admitted with decompensated heart failure because what we didn't want was to judge an ejection fraction to be below 35% when he was just stunned or recovering from, from a recent event. So recent ACSs were excluded up to a month afterwards mm -hmm. and also recent hemodynamic instability. So these are stable patients who are stable from a coronary perspective, mm -hmm. but also a left ventricular perspective. Mm -hmm. But they weren't patients who were who'd never had heart failure symptoms. A one third of our patients who we enrolled actually had had a heart failure hospitalization within the prior two years. It's just that good medical therapy had been instituted so that at the time of, of randomization, they were in a stable phase. Tell us about the trial methods. Yeah, so it was a one-to-one -one randomization, open label, of course, with this kind of trial. Uh, and we started off with 700 patients and ended up randomizing them to roughly equal groups, 347 in the group that had PCI and 353 in the group um, randomized to have optimal medical therapy. Minimum follow-up was for, for two years, but of course we carried out the trial over a 10-year period, including the, the follow-up interval. So some patients had follow-up for up to eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. The primary outcome event was all-cause death mm -hmm. or hospitalization for heart failure. Mm -hmm. And I love that primary outcome. It's relevant uh, and it's not tailored to the intervention. But tell us why you chose all cause rather than cardiovascular death as one of the components. Yeah, no, that's a good question. We, of course, we did look at cardiovascular mortality, but that was a secondary outcome. Mm -hmm. now, I, I think that with the best clinical uh, events committees around, mm -hmm. 
adjudication of cardiovascular mortality is still subjective to an extent. So the most robust outcome that we can collect is all-cause mortality. And in the UK in particular, we have the benefit of a really good centralized records system so that you can track mortality absolutely accurately, all-cause mortality. But when it comes to cause of death, it's a little bit more subjective. So we wanted something that was absolutely clear cut with mm -hmm. no subjectivity involved. So that's the mortality component. And as you said, heart failure hospitalization is actually a patient centric outcome that, that we need to include, not repeat revascularization and all of the, the other uh, outcome components that are often included, which mm -hmm. are really physician, mm -hmm. interventional cardiologist centric, you might mm -hmm. even say. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, was our, that was our key, uh, that was our primary outcome, but we had key secondary outcomes as well. And the first of those was a mechanistic outcome, left ventricular ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. Because when we believe we do good for patients, mm -hmm. it's often mediated, we think, mm -hmm. by an improvement in left ventricular function. Mm -hmm. uh, so we assessed LV function at six months and at 12 months. And then back to patient-centric outcomes, how did they feel? It doesn't matter what we do if their quality of life is poor. So quality of life metrics like the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire were pre-specified major secondary outcomes. Tell us about the baseline characteristics of your patients. Right. So we enrolled uh, an older population mm -hmm. than most uh, trials of uh, poor left ventricular function and definitely older than ischemic cardiomyopathy trials like STITCH, so 70 years, mm -hmm. the median. So half our patients are older than 70 years, which actually is quite unusual for, for this kind of trial. They had a, a mean LV ejection fraction of 27%. So we, we achieved what we wanted to do in terms of mm -hmm. severe LV dysfunction. And that was established through what modality? So entry could be by echocardiography or cardiac MRI. Those are the two modalities. Um, and a lot of coronary disease. Mm -hmm. So remember I said that the minimum BCIS Jeopardy score needed to be six. The median BCIS Jeopardy score was 10. Mm -hmm. So these, this, these are patients with a lot of coronary disease. Mm -hmm. And we didn't exclude patients with left main coronary disease. So mm -hmm. nearly 100 patients had critical left main coronary disease as well as poor left ventricular, fu ventricular function. And we randomized them to medical therapy uh, or revascularization, which I believe is a first amongst RCTs. What was the uptake of medical therapies in the control group? Really good, actually, in, in both groups. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the, the major indicators, um, I, if you look at ACE inhibition, angiotensin receptor blockade, or ARNIs, about 90% were on, on one of those drugs. About 90% were on a beta blocker, and around 50% were on a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. But in addition to the tablet, the pharmacotherapy, the device therapy was also pretty impressive. About a quarter of patients had uh, an ICD with or without uh, resynchronization therapy at baseline. And if you look, we pre-specified that we look for an interval of 90 days from randomization. By then, a much greater proportion. So I think this was, uh, even our heart failure colleagues would be happy, it was a properly medicated, well-managed right. group. And you had heart failure cardiologists involved in the care of these patients? Very much so. So every center had two leads, mm -hmm. a PCI lead and a heart failure lead. And that was, that, that was mandatory for the trial design. Mm -hmm. And they were informed directly by a central medical therapy committee mm -hmm. who reviewed all of the guidelines as, as we went. We anticipated that there'd be lots of changes and boy, were there lots of changes. Mm -hmm. At the start of the trial, no one had even heard of an ARNI. Mm -hmm. Then came along Paradigm, and by the end of the trial, SGLT2 inhibitors. So mm -hmm. it was a moving field, and actually the medical therapy committee were excellent. They were able to translate those results directly, pass it on to our, our centers, and get the patients uh, you know, on individually appropriate therapy. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your treatment effect on the primary composite endpoints, okay. the component endpoints, and the secondary endpoints. <laughs> so. The primary outcome in the medical therapy group happened in 38% of patients mm -hmm. at a median of 3.4 years, which is really quite astonishing. 38% had either died or had a, an admission with severe heart failure. And it was almost exactly the same in the PCI arm. Mm -hmm. All the way through trial follow-up, mm -hmm. the event curves really tracked each other. There was, there was no, no divergence. And actually, this is obviously the, the, the main result is that there was no reduction in uh, all-cause death or heart failure hospitalization. But also, it was, we saw that 
PCI is a very different treatment to, to CABG. Unlike the stitch trial, there was no excess of mortality with right. the then uh, divergence in the opposite direction later on. Not at all. It's just completely overlaid. Right, but overall consistent with stitch in that there was no uh, benefit to revascularization in these high-risk patients. Correct. And also consistent with other uh, PCI trials in the stable coronary artery disease population. Very much. Bang on. What we would, uh, mm -hmm. Ischemia, courage, all of those trials had excluded patients with LV dysfunction. We've now shown what they found. Mm -hmm. is true even of patients with severe LV dysfunction. Absolutely. And perhaps also that our current era of guideline-directed medical therapies that have come a, a long way um, potentially um, had an impact on the overall event rates. Yeah, the, yes they did, but I still think we haven't cracked the, the problem because mm -hmm. if 38% mm -hmm. die or are admitted with severe heart failure, that's not a, a problem solved in my mind. No, absolutely big, not. Big advances mm -hmm. have been made, but we still really need to try and hone in. It may not be that doing PCI is the right thing, but then we need to search for other therapies or try and look for, for groups that, that benefit. Now, you asked about the components. Actually, the major driver of this composite outcome was mortality mm -hmm. and not heart failure hospitalization. Mm -hmm. There were two deaths to every f first heart failure hospitalization. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really driven by, by mortality. And it, it, you know, the, the big picture is that to tackle this burden, uh, we ought to prevent it through management of risk factors yeah. and primordial prevention of risk factors, yeah. I would say. Um, but really no benefit to invasive care in patients with stable coronary artery disease, regardless of viability, uh, in those with impaired LV systolic function. Uh, tell us about the patient reported outcomes. Yeah, that was interesting. So the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire mm -hmm. did improve much more in the PCI group than in the medical therapy group at first. Mm -hmm. So six months, 12 months, there was a clear separation of curves and a clinically meaningful um, gain mm -hmm. in quality of life. But as you went on further and got out to two years, mm -hmm. you saw that the difference had diminished. Mm -hmm. now, it had diminished not because the PCI patient's quality of life dropped, mm -hmm. but because the medical therapy arm gradually caught up, mm -hmm. which again speaks to good medical therapy working for quality of life as well as prognosis, really. Um, and that was mirrored in all of the, the quality of life metrics we used, uh, EQ5D5L, NYHA class, all of those absolutely told us the same story. Okay. If you had to redesign this trial, what would you change? Wow. Um, right now, I, I'm not feeling like I, I, we needed to redesign it necessarily, okay. but I think that there's still a lot of data we have collected. Uh, you know, a wealth of information which we haven't yet paid justice to. So we need to delve more, look at the coronary details more, the revascularization details more, viability. Now, we've, oh, sorry, we brief brushed over left ventricular ejection fraction. There was no difference in the two groups. Mm -hmm. But this is a global metric. Mm -hmm. When we have very regional, we've done segmental analysis by, by a blinded core lab. We have 500 cardiac MRIs done in this cohort, which is the largest collection of cardiac MRIs in an ischemic cardiomyopathy cohort. So there's, and also ICD data. Mm -hmm. We know what happened to those patients who didn't die, but well, we, we will know the data mm -hmm. are there in, uh, in locked in our databases, which we need to, to pull out. Um, so aborted sudden deaths, so there's still a lot to come. So rather than, I haven't yet started thinking about redesigning Revive, but I think there's a lot more to come out of Revive than we have yet seen. Absolutely. Well, let me congratulate you on a well-designed and well-executed trial in your fabulous presentation at ESC. We look forward to more publications to come out of this wonderful work, and I can't wait to see you again. All right. Thank you very much.